hello, I'm James Conlon, and I'm back with uh, Coffee with Conlon. So questions that have been sent in that I will try to ask answer as best I can. Uh, I hope you have your mug of coffee. I have one here that says the magic flute, although I doubt we'll be talking about the magic flute today, but I'll take a sip. And we're ready to go. Here's the first question. In your opinion, what is the best Wagner opera for beginners? Uh, that's a real good question. Now, Beginners means a person who's never seen an opera, or beginners mean a person who has never seen a Wagner opera. Now, let's assume the second for the moment. Uh, I'm a person, I like to go to the opera occasionally. I've heard Verdi, I've heard Puccini, I've heard Mozart. Uh, I'm scared to hear Wagner. Oh, I hear it's very long. I'm not going to understand what's going on. Okay, so my first answer to that is, uh, Wagner's stories all make sense. They're no more complicated than any other stories. The operas are long, and if you uh, if you feel that that is a deterrent, you know what? I say, come to the first two acts and leave. Listen to as much as you enjoy. If you enjoy one act at a time, listen to one act at a time. Length can be a problem, but uh, I say give you know, listen to as much as you can. And listen to some of it at home. You can go on YouTube, you can, there are CDs. Uh, listen to the music. It is all about the music. And so much of Wagner's music has survived in the concert hall. That is the proof that you actually don't even need the whole opera. But I'm here to encourage you to come to the opera because this is Los Angeles Opera. We want you all to be here. So my answer to you is, the Flying Dutchman is the shortest opera. Uh, in the other, on the other side of the ledger, uh, it does not have a break, so you sit there for the whole time. You gotta sit two, and a, two hours and 15 minutes. But that's a good start. Uh, I, I think that's a good start, and I think that, uh, I, I have, have so many favorites, I don't know where to start. But for, give it a chance, give it a try, start listening. And just listen to just listen to how beautiful music is, and I think everything else should flow from there. As for children, I'm not quite sure what the right age uh, to start a child because of the length. But I would say in shorter, uh, shorter excerpts or shorter uh, portions, no, no no reason a child, you know, shouldn't or wouldn't want to hear this, you know, wouldn't enjoy hearing a Wagner opera. So the second question, what separates Tannhäuser from Wagner's other operas? Well, Wagner's operas basically fall into several periods. Uh, the early works, which are not performed very often, there are three. There are, there's one called Die Feen, the fairies. There's one called Liebes Verbot, which is a, uh, a recast of a Shakespeare comedy. And then there's Rienzi. They're not performed very often. And... We really consider the Wagner canon starts with the Flying Dutchman, and we have three early operas, Flying Dutchman, Tannhäuser is the second, Lohengrin is the third. Then we have this immense space that's going to be taken up by the Ring of the Nibelungen, which is going, takes him 20 years to write. And in the middle of that, he wrote Tristan and Isolde, and he wrote Die Meistersinger. And when that was all done at the end, he writes Parsifal. So we think of it as early period, middle period and Parsifal is a late work. Tannhäuser is in the middle of the early period. It is the second work. Uh, one can still feel the roots uh, coming from earlier German, German traditions, Schubert songs, uh, Italian opera with the beautiful Bellini-like melodies, but it's already moved radically toward where it's all going to be going. And Lohengrin, which comes right after that, is another further step. So uh, early opera, but all of the Wagner operas are, com in a way, they are complete universes within themselves. And even though one can draw parallels from, uh, let's say, themes of Wagner's well, preoccupations uh, with the dramatic themes, ideas that go through the entire expanse of his life. Any one of them will give you a complete experience, Tannhäuser included. 
Can I explain the differences between Dresden, Paris, and Vienna versions of Tannhäuser? And which version is Los Angeles Opera staging? Okay, so fix these three dates in your mind, 1845, 1861, and 1875. And these are the three so-called versions. The original, 1845, was performed in Dresden. Wagner had to leave Dresden because he had been, uh, he'd been implicated in a r revolution. And so he, he left Dresden and made his way elsewhere. By 1861, he got what he wanted, which was a production in Paris. And they took Tannhäuser. Now, he had to make some changes for it. And the most important change, most significant change, is that he had to include a ballet because that was, uh, that was absolutely a must in any production in Paris. Now, he wrote that ballet, and instead of having an overture that had a beginning, a middle, and an end, he took away the third part of the overture, and he went directly into this enormous dance called the Bacchanal, and it was placed in Venusberg, which is an imaginary mountain where Venus, goddess of love, reigns supreme, and uh, everybody there seems to be on a uh, constant... A treadmill of sensual acts and pleasures that don't seem ever to end. Uh, but they do end at the end of the Bacchanal, and we, we then go seamlessly into the opera where we meet Tannhäuser for the first time, trying to get free of his uh, obsession and his uh, addiction to Venus, Venus and her ways. Uh, that's what the whole opera is going to be about, the rest of the opera. So the big difference is that now Paris has this ballet, but uh, he really rewrote a lot of the music for Venus. She's a far more important character in terms of just the amount of music uh, uh, which she sings. Uh, that's been expanded, and most of all, harmonically, Wagner's come a long way between 1845 and 1861, and uh, he has produced Tristan and Isolde, and he has pushed harmony to its limits, and you could feel that if you hear the new music that is written in the first scene. There are fairly minor changes later on in the opera, but they are not really very important. The biggest difference is the inclusion of this Bacchanal ballet. Now, what happens in 1875 is that Wagner produces it again in Vienna, he largely keeps the Paris revisions, including the most important Bacchanal. And that was the last time he produced it. But Wagner was never satisfied with Tannhäuser, and he said, only several weeks before he died, I still owe the world my Tannhäuser. So he probably would have revised it if he had lived forever. He probably would have revised it yet again. Now, what are we doing? We do the Paris version only insofar as we are including the Bacchanal. And then we go directly back to the original Dresden version. This modern practice was, uh, was uh, inaugurated by Wieland Wagner, the composer's grandson, and of course the great stage director of Bayreuth. And so in 1961 and 1962, uh, Wieland Wagner came up with that solution for Tannhäuser, and it's become uh, uh, it's become just as valid as the other combinations. That's what we're doing. Can you speak to reconciling the controversy surrounding Wagner as a historical figure and continuing to perform his repertory in 2021? This is, of course, the big knotty problem, and there's no answer to it that's going to satisfy uh, all of us or every part of us. Uh, that's referring to the fact that Wagner's genius is overwhelmingly clear, and the genius of the music is indisputable. The problems start with the person, Richard Wagner. Uh, he was, by all description, a very unappealing and unattractive person. Narcissistic, uh, bullying, self-aggrandizing, and worst of all, deeply anti-Semitic. And so that aspect of it has brings the question, of also because of the Nazi regime's 
appropriation, hijacking of his music as if he were a Nazi. He was not. He, was, he died years before Hitler was born. You can accuse him of anti-Semitism. You cannot accuse him of, uh, of Nazism. Although many people will say, well, he was already a nationalist in a way that led the way. Uh, that is a discussion that would go on for three, four hours and probably not have a resolution. As an artist, my job is to reproduce the work of a composer who is not present here today. I don't have to espouse that composer's viewpoint, agree with his political, religious ideas or anything like that. My job is very simple. Here's the work. This is the work. You, the audience, you react to the work. Uh, and you have, of course, uh, full, full range of reactions that you can have it expressed. So I am troubled by the human being Richard Wagner, but I am not troubled by the extraordinary power, traumatic, musical, harmonic, everything. This man was a giant, and that's why he is still being performed in 2021, and I believe will be always performed. Personally, how has your approach or understanding of Wagner's work changed as you've embarked on your Recovered Voices initiative, if at all? What is Recovered Voices? This is a term we coined here at Los Angeles Opera for the body of works that have been neglected because the composers were suppressed by the Nazi regime. There are as many stories as there are composers, but the common element is we don't play and know their music as well as we ought to, simply because they were victims of a political racist uh, suppression, not because they were not good music. And so my point is that in reviving as much of this and putting it in front of the public, the public now can decide, does it like it or does it not like it? Is this good or is it bad? So that's what Recovered Voices is all about. Uh, so that's a good and an interesting question. And uh, the answer, the short answer would be probably my relationship to Recovered Voices music doesn't really change anything. I think or feel about Wagner. Why? Well, let's first of all remember Wagner's music was all written before Recovered Voices music. So one would not be looking in Recovered Voices to find out, well, did this influence Wagner? However, in looking at Recovered Voices, those composers, almost without exception, idolized Wagner and drew from Wagner's accomplishments. And so uh, they all in some way had a debt to Wagner's example. Uh, but my love for Wagner predates my awareness of the composers who were suppressed by the Nazi regime. I mean, I started, I started going to Wagner operas when I was a teenager and I got, in, I got uh, hooked on them, no question. There's an inebriating, uh, almost a, uh, uh, it's almost an addictive character quality to Wagner because when you get into that Wagnerian world, you don't want to know about anything else. It says that nothing else exists, and this is the power power of his music. Um, and I I, ha I, I have that feeling. I had that feeling when I was a teenager. I just know, I guess, a little bit more than I knew when I was a teenager. This you know, after this much experience, uh, you know, I'm climbing toward 200 op 200 performances of Wagner operas in my life very soon. I hope to make it. Uh, you grow. You grow from doing it. You grow from being inside of it. And uh, I, I'm. I do know that some of my performances of Wagner are different from what they were 25 years ago, 20, 25 years ago. But I don't think that recovered voices has played any role in that. Why do I think Tannhäuser continues to connect with and appeal to modern audiences? Well, I would say that the overwhelming power of the music combined with the dramaturgy of Wagner operas is so convincing that it will convince every generation. One of the characteristics of great art, classic art, is that it has stood the test of time. And I, of course, Wagner has stood the test of time. And I have every reason to believe he, along with Mozart and Beethoven and Verdi, is go are going to, they're all going to continue to, to prove themselves over and over and over again. Because that 
caliber of great music is not tied to any one society, any one geographical place, or any group of people. That is really what makes it uh, transcendent. It transcends time, it transcends place. And Tannhäuser is, to me, part of that transcendent uh, legacy that we have from Wagner and the whole 19th century of opera works that we celebrate here at Los Angeles Opera. What moments are you most excited for audiences to experience when they come to see Tannhäuser? Well, that's another way of asking what's my favorite part of Tannhäuser, and my answer is the whole thing. Uh, I'm not a good one to ask about this because, uh, you know, when I start an opera in a certain way, I know where it's going to go, and I want to be there for every minute of it until the end. I don't want to miss anything. And of course, if you're conducting, you don't because you have to be there present. But if I listen to if if I listen to uh, to a Wagner opera, uh, it's the same. You know, it all makes sense. And the more you listen to it, the more you hear it, the more you get to know it, the more sense it makes. Classical music, I always say the same thing. It's not about the first hearing. It's about the 10th hearing, about the 20th hearing. Classical music has the ability to make us come back to it, hear more the second time and the third and the fourth, so that it gets more enriching and more uh, fulfilling every time you hear the pieces, which is why if with a good piece, and that's many of these pieces, I never, people say, don't you get bored? No, I do not get bored. In fact, I love them more the hundredth time than I did the first time. So my way of saying this quip to you is, come to Tannhäuser. If you like it, come again, because you're going to like it more the second time. And if you don't like it, come again, because you may be surprised on a second hearing, things begin to take shape within you as you hear it. Let's do it. Here's a question that was written in. How have instruments changed since the time that many of the operas we cherish were composed? And what does a conductor have to do with a modern orchestra to accommodate those changes? Excellent question. Now, there are two approaches to answering it. A part of our classical music population has gravitated toward an effort to reproduce old instruments, antique instruments, and to try to recreate a style that would have been created. And so we have a vast army now of represent representatives of playing Baroque music, classical music, uh, in with a new style, which is called uh, well, has many names, but it's about trying to reproduce what it was like. Now, w without going into the pros and cons of that approach, l this question is really asking another question. The instruments now have changed. Do you go back and try to find out what the original sound was, or do you take the instruments as they are and you make and you work with that? That's what I do. Our instrument, we don't even know, we know how the instruments change, but we, we almost really does, don't even know what an orchestra sounded like in 1845 or 1861. We can guess, but the conception of what a symphony orchestra sounds like has grown over time. So the, do we accept that change or do we reject it? Now, what do I do when I look at a score? I know it's written of, uh, 200 years ago or 150 years ago. And I see something that doesn't really sound very convincing on our modern instrument. Let's say it's a question of how to balance a chord in woodwind instruments or, or brass instruments. Uh, sometimes I feel I need to modify something because it doesn't sit well with the new instruments. Uh, one big issue is volume. Our instruments make a lot more sound than they did then. And so it's very easy for an orchestra to overpower singers if you are literally taking every indication of where to play loudly uh, for, for its, uh, at its word. You can't just let, uh, you know, you come to an opera, you have to hear the singing. You have to know that there's a text. So balancing is a very important part of my job uh, especially in the opera house, although to some degree also as in symphonic context. 
So I have to change dyna dynamics quite often. I just modify them, usually in the direction of playing less, less loudly, but still to make a convincing dramatic effect. I often say to musicians, there's nothing more relative than dynamics. How loud is loud? How soft is soft? And how much is my trombone's forte compared to my piccolo's forte? You know, so uh, it's all relative. And uh, I believe a part of the conductor's job is to make everything blend and balance within itself. And to do that, you have to use a lot of common sense and, and your ears. Why do you think that Beethoven only wrote one opera, Fidelio? Faulkner was a great genius, and he believed himself to be a great genius, and as such, really, really idolized few other people. But I'd say the two people he idolized were Shakespeare and Beethoven. So Beethoven wrote one opera, one music drama, Fidelio. Uh, and to what degree, why did he only write one? Well, he had so much trouble writing it that it took him 20 years, and he made revisions that are massive. And so we have now a version that we always perform, but it took him so much, took so much out of him that I think he simply didn't have it in him to do that again. And so he wrote his nine symphonies and his 32 piano sonatas and his three quartets and everything else, but we only have one opera. Now, Wagner is just the opposite. Wagner basically only wrote his music dramas. Uh, and, so, and we excerpt from them, we make, uh, we make orchestral uh, concert pieces, but they, basically he had a single focus. It was music drama. Beethoven had a, had a broader focus on the forms in which he was going to write, and it just took so much effort and, uh, and suffering, because he really suffered over Fidelio, to produce it. I think that's why he only wrote one opera. So that's Coffee with Conlon for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you uh, got something out of the uh, discussion. Please send in questions. I love to have them. I hope that you'll all come to Tannhäuser, not once, but twice at least, maybe three times. I'll be there six times in all, and we'll look forward to the next Coffee with Conlon.